An important concept when using geospatial data, especially when mapping or working with two separate data sets, is the idea of a coordinate reference system or a geographic coordinate system. Let's figure out what that means, why it's important, and how we'll use it. So when we think of something on the Earth, it seems kind of easy to think about where it is, right? It's just latitude and longitude. New York, oh yeah, 40 north, 74 west, problem solved, right? Now it turns out things aren't that simple. And to know why, let's think about the shape of the Earth. My question to you is, what's our planet shaped like? Your first impulse might have been, it's a sphere, which is what we've been told all our lives. A nice perfectly round thing spinning out in space. Looks beautiful, right? Now, eh, it's kind of close. As long as you don't think the Earth is flat, you're probably okay. But it's not quite right, as a sphere is perfectly round, but the Earth isn't perfectly round. It's a little more natural. So let's try again. If you take a sphere, a perfectly round sphere, and you squish it a little bit, what do you get? You get this. It's called an ellipsoid. Circles that become 3D are spheres, and ellipses that become 3D make ellipsoids. Seems like a reasonable shape, right? It's definitely closer to what the real Earth is like, because the real, real Earth isn't a sphere, but it isn't actually how the Earth is shaped. The Earth is shaped, semi-unfortunately, like a potato. I mean, not exactly like a potato, but it's just not clean like an ellipsoid or a sphere. It's got bumps and unevenness, and in, it just isn't something that you can have a mathematical model of. So the thing is, you can't just make a model of this guy right here, right? If you want to put clean latitude and longitude lines evenly spaced around it, it's not going to work unless you do the one thing that you want to do, and that is make something up. So what you do is you shrug and you say, look, I know the Earth is a potato, but we can't make a mathematical model of that. We can't put nice lines around a potato. So what we're going to do is just pretend the Earth is an ellipsoid and go from there. It's close enough, right? Now the problem is it isn't always close enough and no one really agrees about what that ellipsoid should look like or where it would go in relation to the real Earth. So in 1866, someone was like, I have found the best ellipsoid to use as a model of the Earth. And as we can see, it wasn't really that good. Then in 1980, some other people came around and they said, no, wait, I have one that fits the Earth a little bit better. Then, 1984, other people came around and said, oh, that 1980 thing was terrible. Here's what we have in 1984. And everyone got real excited about that one. So you're just like, please, come on, just pick one, right? But the thing is, even if they did pick one, that doesn't mean we figured everything out. The problem is that these ellipsoids don't fit perfectly inside of the Earth so there's still a little bit of wiggle room about where it actually goes. So if you have it down on the bottom right, or you could push it up into the top left, for example, you might have it fit North America really well if you push it down in one corner, or if you push it in another corner, suddenly it's better for Europe, shove it in another direction, it's better for Korea or Japan or whatever. And the thing is that everybody wants this ellipsoid to go where it's best for them. This actually has a term, it's called the datum. So we have the ellipsoid, which is the shape of the Earth, shall we say. Then we have the datum, which is where the ellipsoid goes. Now, you can put these ellipsoids in different places and come up with different models. For example, NAD83, North, American datum of, guess when? Yes, 1983. And oddly enough, this one fits really well in North America. You put the fake mathematical model of the Earth up in one corner, suddenly it's working great for North America. North America loves it. 
But what about people in Australia? It's not working very well from them. It's going to fit poorly in Australia. So in Australia, they have another one called GDA94, the geocentric datum of Australia from 1994. My favorite thing about GDA94 is GDA, I swear you'd pronounce that as good day, like good day mate. And since it's Australia, it just kind of makes sense. I haven't been able to prove it, but I'm pretty sure it's true. So what happens is when you put together an ellipsoid, so the shape of the Earth, and a datum, which is where you attach the fake Earth to the real Earth, that is called a coordinate reference system or a geographic coordinate system. Every time you have a location on the Earth, it's using some sort of CRS. It's making some sort of assumptions about the Earth. And oh man, you can make a lot of assumptions. If you aren't even concerned with mapping most of the world, you can get even crazier than wiggling around the datum. You can just invent a shape for like Nebraska and say, okay, we don't care about anything else. All we care about is Nebraska. So if you measure Connecticut, the numbers will be so, so wrong. But here's an ellipsoid and datum just for Nebraska. So as long as you're measuring Nebraska, everything's gonna be great. And then along with that, you can say, you know what? This is such a small area. Maybe we don't want to use latitude and longitude. Let's just use meters instead. So the United States is actually built up of a system like this. Um, it's called the state plane system. And what it is, is a bunch of different zones all across America that all are coordinate systems just for these little tiny areas. So if you thought latitude and longitude was confusing, or if you thought the fact that latitude and longitude might be different in North America versus Australia, oh, this is, this is so much worse. Um, they're really exact for measuring small areas, and since no one understands degrees, it's a pretty good system in the US, even though I don't think we really understand meters. So Switzerland also has a projection for itself, Norway, Hong Kong. Anytime you're measuring something smaller than the entire globe, you're going to pick a system that, instead of doing the whole globe, like one of these here, it's just gonna be a CRS, a coordinate reference system, a shape of the ellipsoid, a shape of the datum that is specific to that one area. So. If I give you a latitude and a longitude and say, here's where something is, that isn't enough to actually know what I'm talking about. You have to know what kinds of assumptions I'm making about the shape of the Earth and where that shape goes inside of the Earth. So along with simple coordinates like latitude and longitude, we always need to know the spheroids and the datums. We need to know the units, pretty much everything else. When you want to communicate that information to people, there are a few ways to do it. The most terrifying is this right here. It's called well-known text, which seems like a very friendly name for something that isn't very friendly. So what this does is it describes all of the assumptions that go into a coordinate reference system or a geographic coordinate system. This one are all the assumptions for NAD 83 Canis Albers, which is the Albers projection for the continental United States. And if we look at it, we see some of these words. So the datum is North America 1983. We have the spheroid here. We have the units here. It's going to be degrees. So we can already kind of understand this, even though it's kind of confusing. So the thing is, no one wants to keep track of all of these different things. Unit, degree, spheroid, this one, uh, all this other stuff with parallels and latitudes and longitudes uh, and even more meters and x's and y's. No one wants to keep track of it. No one wants to type all of this in, remember all of this. And additionally, there are a bazillion different examples of uh, projections and coordinate re reference systems. There's this one. Uh, there's 
WGS84, it has a certain ellipsoid, a certain datum. NAD83 has a certain ellipsoid, a certain datum. BD09 has a certain ellipsoid, a certain datum. And it goes on and on forever and ever and ever. So not all systems actually have fancy names like that. Not that WGS84 is very fun, or NAD83 is fun, or BD09. Can't type BD apparently. BD09 is fun. But these are just kind of common names for each of these geographic reference systems, these coordinate reference systems. So the names might be a little confusing. They might be hard to memorize. So every single coordinate reference system actually has a secret code. They have what's called an EPSG code. So if we look at this one, this continental United States Albers projection has the EPSG code of 5070. This one right here, WGS84, has the EPSG code of 4326. NAD83 has the EPSG code of 4269. GDA94, good day mate, is EPSG 4939. So EPSG, funnily enough, stands for the European Petroleum Survey Group, because apparently the only people that care about locating things on the planet and care about where things should go and being very specific about that, those are the people that are finding oil or used to find oil. Uh, they don't exist anymore. They were folded into somewhere else. But we still use EPSG codes to refer to different sets of ellipses, datums, units, things like that. Any sort of assumptions we're making about the planet or about our mathematical model of the planet <coughs> comes through as an EPSG code. Now, finally, if you're thinking about Mars, the EPSG doesn't care about Mars because you're not going to get oil from Mars, I guess. On Mars, you use IAU codes, which stands for the International Astronomical Union. The most important thing to remember about these EPSG codes isn't what the code itself is. The most important thing to remember is that it is an EPSG code, EPSG, European Petroleum Survey Group. I guarantee that you are going to misspell it as ESPG instead. And the thing is, you're not going to get an error message about that. It's not going to say, hey, you typed this wrong. You need to switch this to EPSG. It's just going to break, and it's going to be terrifying. So remember, EPSG, European Petroleum Survey Group. So why is any of this important? Why do I care about all of these coordinate systems? We should be fine without it. No. The thing is, when you're dealing with multiple data sets, maybe you're trying to count the number of gas stations inside of a county or the number of restaurants in a state, we are trying to see how many people live near a power plant or something like that. When you're making these comparisons, every single geographic data set that you use is going to have certain assumptions built into it. Your restaurant latitudes and longitudes are going to have an idea about the shape of the ellipsoid, where the ellipsoid is inside of the potato of the Earth, what units it's using, things like that. If you have a bunch of states, polygons of shapes, it's also going to have the same things. Assumptions about the shape of the Earth, assumptions about where that ellipsoid goes inside of the real Earth, units, all of that. So if you're going to compare two different data sets, you have to make sure that they agree. If one is measuring location in meters and another is doing it in degrees, you're never going to be able to compare them. If one data set thinks the Earth is shaped one way 
and another data set thinks the Earth is shaped slightly differently, you aren't going to be able to get accurate comparisons of measurements. So for example, if I have one that's GRS 80, where the ellipsoid is right here, and one that's WGS 84, where the ellipsoid is almost in the same spot, but we see there's a little bit of difference as we go around. These will both be latitude and longitude, the units will be the same, but only here where the two lines kind of become very close will those numbers actually be close to the same. As those two ellipsoids or those two datums separate, it starts to become more difficult to compare the two. So what you need to do is take one of them and convert it into the other ellipsoid. If you have one mathematical model of the Earth, as long as you know which one you're coming from, you can convert it to any other thing. So if I have a point in WGS84, it's really easy for me to convert it to NAD83. Or if I have one in NAD83, it's really easy to convert it to GDA94 for use in Australia. Now, it's not easy for you, it's easy for pandas to do it, because or geopandas, because geopandas knows how math works, you don't know how the math works, you just say, please, geopandas, make these ellipsoids the same, make these datums the same, make these units the same, and then we'll be good. So, one final thing for you to remember, and that is, of course, make sure EPSG is what you type. EPSG, not ESPG, European Petroleum Survey Group. Hopefully, you now have a little bit of a grasp on coordinate reference systems or geographic coordinate systems, whatever you want to call them, or at least why they're important or why they exist. That is going to help you an incredible amount once you actually start to work with geographic data because there's a CRS built into every geographic data set. Like I said, just because you have latitude and longitude doesn't mean two things are comparable. All it means is they're both using degrees. So you, there are certain assumptions about what their ellipsoid is and what their datum is. Whether it's a shapefile, whether it's a CSV, you're going to be dealing with the CRS, whether you like it or not. So, in the name of the potato that is Earth, let's learn to love CRSs, or at least tolerate them a little bit. <laughs>